All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 3, XML. And so it's in tonight when we introduce the first of a few approaches to databases. The culmination, of course, will be actually using MySQL and an actual database engine. But for now, we're going to take sort of an intermediate step that's actually not really meant just to be a uh, sort of plaything exercise, but actually something that's quite useful. In fact, the course's own website is dynamic uh, in several ways, among which is our own ability as a staff to actually update the content here. So you've probably at one point clicked on the lectures link and you've been led to a little page like this. Well, this is just some fairly identically structured XHTML that spits out each and every one of these lectures and all of the links laterally. And just as an administrative convenience, we store all of this data in an XML file. And we came up with an arbitrary schema, as we'll call it tonight, just an arbitrary XML format. We have tags like open bracket lecture and close bracket and all of that. And we just maintain our information there so that when it's time to post new material, as I just did with some source code for lecture three, I just open up any old text editor, whether it's Nano, Vim, Emacs, Notepad, whatever, edit the file quickly, hit save, and voila, the website automatically generates the new HTML or XHTML for us. So you'll be using it in project one, as you know, for representation of a pizzeria's database. And if you've not noticed already, the PDF uh, for project one did go live tonight. Uh, so we don't bring printouts, but we do have it online for everyone. So you can start diving into that. You have three weeks for it. And these projects, realize, are designed to be spread across three weeks, not to be started and completed, say, three weekends from now. So do realize that it's a very good place to be in if you can put in 10 hours this week and 10 hours next week and spread it out and then really put the fi finishing touches on that Saturday, Sunday before they're actually due. I think you'll find yourself with just some unnecessary stress if you try to cram everything into, say, that last weekend. They're meant to be meatier than that because we don't have many, but they are spread across three weeks. Uh, so more on that in tonight's section. If you're able to stick around or even if you're not, it will be filmed, but Sid will be doing um, a tour of Project One and some related material. And also a heads up that next week we'll actually be joined by a guest lecturer, uh, Mr. David Heitmeyer, who teaches computer science uh, E153, which is an XML-oriented course on web uh, application development. He'll be filling in for me next week since I have to travel for a little conference of sorts. Um, so we'll continue our same discussion of XML, uh, but with him at the helm. So more on that on Monday. Uh, with that said, let's wrap up one detail that we left off with last time. Let's see if I can dim our lights a little bit. As promised, we were going to introduce the ability to actually have some kind of login mechanism for a site. And that is pretty much an omnipresent uh, feature of websites today. But it's also really useful because we can implement it using um, the same building blocks that we introduced last week, sessions, namely. So quick review then. What is a session? Uh, what is a session on the high level? What's the definition? Server-side object, so it's some kind of server-side memory storage space that you, the programmer, can put most anything you want in it. You can put some integers, you can put some strings. If you're familiar with object-oriented programming, you can put actual objects. And where are session objects? Where are the contents of dollar sign underscore session ultimately stored, at least on our server, as with most? Uh, not quite in a cookie. Not quite in a cookie. Where are the contents of the variable, the super global stored? Yeah, so in slash temp on our Linux file system, was there a text file for every one session? And inside of that was a quote unquote serialized version of the object called dollar sign underscore uh, session. So what is actually stored in the cookie, though, that's sent to the user? It's not the actual contents of everything, but rather, yep, so there's some kind of, sorry? Yeah, exactly. The, the key, the, uh, the very large unique number that was assigned to that user and that is also found in the name of the file. Now, as an aside, you can actually use things other than slash temp to actually store these session objects. You can use a full-fledged database uh, if that becomes necessary. You can use other file systems. doesn't have to be the local slash temp. But recall that the cookie name by convention in PHP is PHP sesh ID. And as you start to tackle project one, and if you start sniffing your own traffic with live HTTP headers, the Firefox plugin, you may very well see this going back and forth across the wire. It's not really that important or useful um, because this is a mechanism implemented sort of automagically by PHP for you to make sure you have that illusion of actually having access to dollar sign underscore session. There is one catch though. If you want to be able to use dollar sign underscore session, which I wish were uh, verbally more easily pronounced, 
you, can, you have to call what function? Session start. So this is, again, sort of a very easy newbie mistake. Any PHP page that your users are going to visit that need to use session data must have this function at the very top. Now, with that said, because another common mistake related to this is putting it in the wrong place, the safest rule of thumb is to make this line of code the very first in your .php file. The reason being, session start does a couple of things, one of which is to spit out an HTTP header. What HTTP header is it spitting out? There's, there's a, we haven't talked about that many headers. So what of the few headers we've discussed, what might make sense for this thing to trigger being sent to the client from the server? Sorry, oh, cookie. So cookie, there, and it's not, um, uh, so it's not cookie, but the sort of server version of that, which is set cookie. Right? For the whole process to get jump started, the server has to assign to the client a big pseudo random number. That is a value for PHP sesh ID. So what this thing does, among other things, is actually send that cookie that the client had better start sending back in response. And the client's response is just cookie colon. But the server's uh, initial message recall is set hyphen cookie colon. Now, I tease that there's only a few headers, because really, we've only looked at a few. Like, there's those two, there's location colon, and frankly, those are the only three useful ones we've talked about that you might exercise some control over. But that's what it boils down to, is those basic primitives. So here is a little page, home.php. It looks like this, uh, very underwhelming, but meant just to be a simple example of four approaches tonight to logging a user in and actually maintaining state even though my spinning globe or whatever my icon is has stopped spinning. So HTTP, recall, is a stateless protocol. It opens, you open a connection, HTTP sends a request like get slash index.html, HTTP slash 1.1, you get a response and then bam, the connection is closed unless there are still some GIFs or JPEGs or stupid little things to go fetch. But once those are downloaded, bam, the connection is closed. Now, the implications for that is that I had better have laid the foundation for remembering who this user was. And that is, in fact, what cookies are being used for. Because the next time I click a link, the client is hopefully going to send the cookie header, which is going to remind the server which of the files in slash temp is mine. So I can then, in my PHP code, remember what it was I knew about this user the last time they saw me. So cookies, and in turn sessions in PHP, sort of allow us to use a stateless protocol like HTTP to actually maintain state, which is incredibly useful. Otherwise, all of the popular sites you all use today just would not work. You'd be constantly logging in or doing something incredibly tedious. All right, so I am not logged in. But there's four versions of this login example that will log me in. And here's the first. I spent no time at all whatsoever on aesthetics, focusing instead on the functionality. But the goal of this is going to be to exercise the following. Um, I know, because I looked at the source code, that the username that will work is jharvard, and that the password that will work is crimson. If I go ahead and click login, what happens is, disable my little password reminder thing, I'm whisked away to some page that then sends me back to home.php, and voila, you are logged in, log out. OK, so that's useful, because I can demonstrate now, I'm just going to hit reload a lot. So I'm reloading, and it still remembers that I'm logged in. I mean, frankly, I can be, well, do I want to be this dramatic? Well, if I trusted the internet access in this room more, I would physically disconnect my computer, then say, voila, I'm really disconnected, plug it back in, click a link, and you'd see that I'm still, in fact, logged in. Uh, but that would probably waste 10 minutes knowing this particular setup. So we won't do that. But in theory, it should work. So how did I actually do this? Well, let's take a look. Home.php is very uninteresting. But notice that there is some logic in it. So home.php is this page here. And notice that I'm conditionally saying either you are not logged in or you are logged in and with this additional link. So what does this look like? Well, here's the XHTML source code. Let me zoom in a little bit. And notice that right up here is a condition. So if session authenticated, quote unquote, uh, is apparently true, because this is just a parenthetical, print out you are logged in, a line break, and then a logout link. Else, per this tag here, print you are not logged in. 
OK, so we saw this syntax, right? Last week, we showed two approaches. We have like using colons to say if, then do this, else, colon, and then we had an end if statement. This was just another way of using similar syntax, but using curly braces to encapsulate different conditions. So here, we actually have a pretty clean implementation of a PHP page. Up at the top are just some comments. But I also enabled sessions. And notice I enabled sessions before I started spitting out any XHTML content. As we've seen multiple times, the headers go across the wire first and then the content. So you have to take care to make sure the headers do, in fact, per this function call, get sent out first. All right, so if I scroll down, here is this part. So what is probably going on when I click the login button and provide jharvard and crimson, which I know a priori are, legitimate username and password. What must be happening with the file to which the submit button is sending me? I'm sorry? Good, OK, so uh, the file that I'm submitting to, login1.php, is doing some kind of lookup in a database or wherever saying, oh, jharvard and crimson are in fact legitimate credentials, then what is the code probably doing? OK, but I'm already done there, so I have back a net yes answer. Setting authenticated DS. Yes, so apparently, and we can infer this from this side of the story, what does it mean to log the user in? Step one, check their credentials, username and password. And once you've decided this person's legit, we need to remember that they're legit. And because I'm apparently checking the value of dollar sign underscore session authenticated here, it must be the case that my login code remembers that the user is logged in by storing what value at that location in session? A Boolean true, or one, or whatever. But the point is, it's a non-false uh, value. All right, so let's take a look then. So login1.php, and you actually have printouts of this from last week. So this isn't new code, um, but it's also available on the course's website. I'm going to open uh, source login login one. PHP. OK, so this file starts with some comments. And font size wise, is, is it readable in back? And I'll zoom in as needed. OK. So notice here, the very first thing I did is I enabled sessions with session start. OK. So now, OK, so apparently I really cut some corners. I didn't want to bother having a whole database for a very simple demo. So I just hard coded in one user. And I'm using constants. So in PHP, you can define a constant by using the define function. It takes two values, the name and the value of the constant. By convention, as you know, for most languages, people tend to use all uppercase, hence user and pass. OK, so there's the jharvard and crimson credentials. And now what am I doing? Well, notice that this file, login1, is apparently, let's see, I think that's where I submitted to. So let me go back to version 1. Let me check the source code of this page. And let me zoom in here. And in fact, where am I submitting this form to? To myself, login1.php. So there's a couple of approaches you can take when implementing form handling in PHP. And you'll see this in section or in future examples. You can, one, have a file like login.php, have an action value that submits to like login2. PHP. And you can essentially have then separate files for st separate steps in the process of submitting this form. So login 1 shows the page, and maybe login 2 processes the login. And then maybe login 3.php is a, a successful, happy, uh, welcome message to my site. You've logged in. All right, so you can have sort of steps back and forth. But now consider this, even in the abstract. If you visit a website and you're filling out a form, and you click Enter, and that form gets submitted to a new file, like login2.php, what's a common scenario when people try to log into a website or fill in a form? What often happens? So they make a mistake. And generally, it's helpful. So there's multiple ways of handling user mistakes. You can have this second step, say, sorry, you screwed up. You need, an e you need a valid email address. Press your browser's back button to go back. Now, that's fine. But a downside of this approach, very often, it seems, is what? What's bad about that approach? Yeah. Very often, if the, brow if the server has told your browser, don't cache this page, which is generally useful, uh, you could hit the back button and you'll get the original form, but it will be blank. And there's nothing more infuriating, frankly, and I say this from experience, from having filled out a really long form and then it's all gone because you made some one stupid, simple mistake. So websites, fortunately, uh, will let you click their own button. So you can click their own button, like go back and redo. And if they're actually forcing the user to click a link, 
well, then the server could certainly regenerate the form and pre populate it with my previous values. Just conceptually, that makes sense. The server knows what I typed, it can remind me of all of my inputs. But what's more commonly done is you click submit. And you get what? Like a little error message, or the fields become red, or you set, get some kind of immediate feedback on the same screen, which maybe from a user interface perspective is better because you're still on the same page. It's very clear where the errors are. There's no unnecessary forward and back. You just see the same form with the errors somehow highlighted. So, what's one way we can do this? Well, it's hard if you go from login.php, submit to login2.php, because if login2 either needs to let the user in, or yell at them for having done some things wrong, login2 might have to redisplay the same form. But that form was probably defined where? In login.php. So now you just get this kind of messy situation where the form you want to display was implemented here, but this file might need to redisplay it sometimes. OK, so then those of you with more programming experience might think, well, I'll have some kind of template or whatnot. I'll factor that code out. It's totally possible. But there's arguably a simpler approach, which is to have just one login file, login.php, and have the form submit to itself and just put your logic entirely in that same file. So you have two states in your file. One is the default one, which is if the user is visiting me for the first time, just show the page. I've got no logic to perform. Second state is, oh, user has submitted via get or post some data to me. Let me now either check that it's right, and if it is, I'm going to send them to the next page, like home.php with a HTTP redirect using the location header. Or if they've screwed up, you know what? Let me reshow the same form, which is defined in the same file, but let me highlight some of the fields in red or something like that. So that's the approach I took here, really just to keep things nice and neat and tidy. I'm just going to have one file implementing login, and that's why this form submits to myself. And that's, in fact, OK. I just need really an if condition that says, if form submitted, do this. If no form submitted, just show the form. OK, so how did we do this? So here's login1.php again. I enable sessions. I define these constants. And now here's that condition I just alluded to. If the user field in post is set, is set as a PHP function, returns true or false if a variable has been set, if a key in an associative array has been set, and a pass field has been sent in post, do the following. But let's start from step one. The first time I visit this page like this, I've not clicked the button. I've not submitted any data. So what's going to be the uh, the Boolean value of this expression. False. So false. So let's just ignore that code completely. And let's fast forward. Fast forward. OK, I get to this. There's no else, apparently. So if there's no else, that means the PHP processor is just going to keep falling through, and it's going to do what it's told. It's told here, exit PHP mode. So what gets sent to the browser? Just this raw HTML, this raw XHTML, because I've not called exit. I've not redirected the user. So if nothing told the uh, PHP otherwise, I'm just going to see these contents. Now, there's not much. It's essentially an XHTML table. And there is some stuff here. Apparently, I'm going to optionally say something like invalid login, but more on that in a moment. Oh, here's interesting. I did not hard code the name login1.php to this file. In fact, in the dollar sign underscore server super global, I think we dumped its contents a week or so ago, and you saw a whole bunch of stuff. My IP address, the name of the server, all of these sort of uh, application independent uh, details. Well, this one called PHP self is a, global, is a variable you get, a key you get, that just gives you access to the name of the current file. And why is this you know, arguably a nice design decision here to use this instead of writing login1.php? Perfect. Like if I change the name of the file, I don't have to change my code. Everything's much more portable. Now I pay maybe a slight performance penalty because now I'm executing some additional code. But frankly, this is PHP. This is an interpreted language. Spending a few more CPU cycles here and there is what one of the motivations for using a language like this is in the first place. So it's, it's, it's reasonable. But I could have hard coded in the name. But I am using post. So that explains now the use of uh, dollar sign underscore post up above. And now let's see what I've got. I've got a username uh, prompt. I've got an input here. Oh, and what do you think this is doing here, just as a teaser? Why do I have value equals quote unquote and then some PHP code? Yeah, so if I somehow got to this display of the form and yet I already have a value for user in post, well, let's show the user what it was. Let's pre populate this, but probably not. Yep. 
not the password field, which wouldn't, isn't typically done. OK, so in short, if I visit this page for the first time, that if condition does not evaluate to true, so I fall through and I just get some raw HTML, and all of this PHP code, because it's a server-side language, disappears. So all I see here in the raw source code sent to the browser is just some XHTML. And in fact, yep, I didn't submit a username yet, so the value is, in fact, blank. OK, so now let's actually submit, as I did the first time around. J Harvard, Crimson. Now let's just be a little curious. I'm going to pull up my little sniffer here, click Login. And what happens? Well, let's scroll up. Uh, what, was, what did I just visit? I visited this. OK, what did I do? I posted to this address. This is the server's name. And what? Ah, oh, here we go. So if you've ever wondered how get is different from post, Fundamentally, not all that much. So in get, you have after the question mark in the URL, uh, parameter equals value, ampersand, parameter equals value, ampersand. This post does the exact same thing, but it puts it in below the headers. The motivation here is that even though there is some slightly poorly defined upper bound on the length of URLs, there's no upper bound on the amount of stuff you can send after HTTP headers. And so what the post mechanism does is it sends a header called content length which tells the server, I'm going to send you 26 bytes. And then after that, it sends the 26 bytes. Mm -hmm. And in this way, can post send an arbitrary amount of data because you actually send it after the headers and not wedged into the URL. Yeah. Oh. What's that? <sighs> Good question. Is there a way to encrypt the password? Short answer is not really. Um, you, can do, you can encrypt the password with JavaScript. Or you can encrypt the entire transaction using SSL, if I used an HTTPS URL. And the latter is what's most commonly done. But we're not bothering with SSL. It's meant actually to be interesting in that we're revealing it. But there's no way to tell the browser with some special tag, encrypt this field. It's essentially an all or nothing thing, unless you whip out some JavaScript. Uh, yeah? Uh, good question. And as with most of these questions, my, the answer is probably depends. Is it better to use post than get? It depends. Um, sending sensitive information, post, absolutely. Because it keeps it out of the URL, it keeps it out of the browser's cache and history and all of that, which is good. But always using post would be annoying, frankly, because then you couldn't copy URLs and paste them into emails and send them to people. You couldn't bookmark pages because there's no state maintained in the URL. So it depends on what, you, what feature you want to provide the users for a particular page. So get is actually often preferable so that you're maintaining state in a copy-pastable way. Uh, question or comment in back? Same. Same? OK. OK, so after this, then there's some stuff, a response from the server. But at the end of the day, we actually get the information to the code. So let's see what the code actually did with it. Let me close my little sniffer. Let me go back to the top of this file. And now that I've hit submit, this if condition is true. So you have a couple of ways in PHP of checking, is there a value present in a variable? One way is to check if the variable is simply set. So by calling is set on post, and then in brackets, the name of a variable, you'll get back true if there was a value, if that key has been defined. The only context here in which that would be defined is if I actually clicked the submit button. Otherwise, post would not contain this key. All right, same deal for the pass field over there. All right, so after that, I do another check. And as I have in the comments here, if the user uh, parameter equals equals user. Now, this is the constant defined before. And notice, I did not put quotes around it. Had I, then I'd be literally looking for a username of uh, U-S-E-R. It's clearly wrong. Um, and the password equals the constant called pass. What do I do? Well, as was proposed, all I do, thanks to cookies and sessions, to remember that the user has authenticated is I set some flag in my session object called authenticated to true. Now, I could have called it anything. I could have called it foo, bar, baz, whatever. I chose the slightly long but very specific variable called authenticated, or key called authenticated. And I set it to true. Now, what do I do? Well, the right way to redirect a user is this. And this is done improperly in a whole bunch of code that you'll see on the internet and maybe even in books and also in um, like uh, free open source software you might download. The right way to issue an HTTP redirect with the location field is to send a full URL. What a lot of people do is just send the a relative URL, like the name of the file to which you want to redirect the user. And it's unfortunate, because frankly, that's really preferable. I would love to have been able to write and claim it's correct 
to just say this, because this is so easy, it's so clear, but technically it's wrong. Browsers mostly will acknowledge this, because they'll get a location header that says home.php, and they'll just assume that you mean it's relative to the current URL. That's in violation of the spec, technically. So what I did here was I copied and pasted a little sample code from php.net's manual, which says you really need to construct a full URL. And we won't dwell on the specifics here, because you can look at the manual for this. But what I'm doing here is figuring out using this key in the server super global and using a function called rtrim, which trims off white space as needed, dir name, which tells you just the directory in which a file is in, and then this variable to essentially reconstruct the full URL that the user just visited. This is the recommended way. There's probably a half a dozen or more other ways you could do this. But the end result, as this suggests, is that I send a full URL. Yeah? It tells you one directory, but the full path there, too. So it sends the full path to the directory in which that file exists. OK, yeah. I'm sorry, say again? Good question. Where in the, am I indicating to the browser that it has to use post instead of get? Right there. Right there. And again, inconsistency. XHTML requires that this valid be lowercase to be valid, um, even though everywhere else it's used in a capitalized sense. Uh, oh, well, there is. Had we used get, we can just use this. Yep, that exists as well. Yep. OK, now I, I normally don't get so adventurous, but I thought I would try a little test here. Let me go ahead and uh, let me open up Safari. And I'm going to go to the same home page. And uh, does it let me? Uh, let me try something real fast. Uh, preferences, security, enable, accept cookies. OK, so we're going to try a little test. I didn't check this in advance, so hopefully it will actually work as it should. I'm going to see if disabling cookies actually breaks a website, since this is something people are constantly warned of. So let's see what the effect is. So I loaded up Safari, just because I know its preferences a little better. I'm going to now go ahead and click in here, version 1, J Harvard, Crimson, and log in. OK, seems to work. So let me go ahead and click Log Out. And we'll look at what that code does in just a moment. It's fairly brief. Now I'm back logged in. If I reload a bunch of times, I am, in fact, logged in. And just to be super anal, I'm going to reset all of Safari so that there's no extra state lying around. OK, now I'm going to go back to this page. Now, and here's where I'm crossing my fingers that lecture demos done on the fly actually work, I'm going to go to my security pane of Safari. I'm going to say accept cookies never. Let's hope this works. Otherwise we'll Cut the following five minutes from the tapes. And uh, now I'm going to click version one. I'm going to click J Harvard, Crimson. Damn it, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, it's apparently disabling persistent cookies and not session cookies. OK, no more demos on the fly when I get curious. Never, never. Wow, that's really lame. OK, it's really impressive security that your browsers today offer, huh? OK. So apparently, that's not a problem. So your website will work even if users turn off cookies. I'll try it again with some other mechanism. Um, I suspect what's happening is persistent cookies, storing them as files, are disabling. But Apple is being a little misleading by saying disable cookies, because this is how that whole thing is implemented. So a little white lie on their part. Just like erasing your hard drive doesn't really erase your hard drive, if you know that. <laughs> Anyhow. Logout.php, what does it take to forcibly log out the user? Well, there's a few things you can do. And if you read the PHP manual, there's a few things you should do. Um, and these are them. So one, um, I'm enabling uh, session start, which probably, to set cookie, probably isn't technically necessary at the top. But I just got into the habit anyway. And it's not a bad thing here. But what I'm going to do here is delete any cookies. So I also will see in a more advanced version of the login mechanism, I'm also going to pre-populate um, the fields user and pass for better or for worse. We'll see that doing that with pass, probably not such the best idea. But then notice this trick. And this is taken right from the manual. The right way to kill the session is, yes, to call an analog of session start called session destroy. But you should also 
reset the cookie called PHP sesh ID, which you can get dynamically by calling this function, because this is the default, but it's not necessarily the name that's specified by the sysadmin in the config file. So this dynamically gives me that. I'm going to set its value to quote unquote. And this is sort of a conventional hack. Uh, one of the best ways to set a cookie's expiration to, be, uh, to happen now is to say this cookie expired already several minutes ago, and to say it essentially happened in the past. So little trick there. But in short, this is one of those things just when you destroy a session, these are the lines of codes folks tend to use. And the effect of that is to blow away the contents of dollar sign underscore session, which means programmatically if I then check that field in home.php, it won't be there anymore. So the user has, in fact, effectively been logged out. But let's see if we can improve upon this. So we have another iteration of this that actually is slightly useful in that it pre-populates the field if uh, the user logs in, in unsuccessfully. And actually, we had the same thing in the previous version. So let me go ahead and try this. Version 2 or version 1, let me actually mistype the password just by typing in some nonsense this time. Click Login. And now I have pre-populated my form. And this is not hard. We already actually spoiled this surprise by pointing out this line of code here. I'm simply echoing out the value of the value in the users care, uh, field. So that's useful. And frankly, I mean, again, take notice of websites you visit. Clearly, is it easy to do something like this? So there's really no reason for websites not to pre-populate fields. And most do. But those that don't should be sort of slapped on the hand for this being such an easy thing, to be honest. But as a matter of security, I've not pre-populated the password field, because I'm assuming they more likely got that wrong, less likely their username. OK, so let's look at the third variant of this. So in login 3, let me scroll down here. And now notice there's this new line of code. Does it pop out at you? What's that? Yeah, so set cookie. So we've been using cookies all this time by calling session start, but the cookie handling was all done for us automatically by PHP. If I, the programmer, actually want some data to persist on the user's computer, I can call a function called set cookie manually. And I can give the cookie a name, in this case user. I can give the cookie a value, in this case the same thing they typed into the form themselves. And then what seems to come after that is the third argument to set cookie. Yeah, so an expiration time. So I arbitrarily decided, call the time function, which returns a Unix timestamp for now, number of seconds since like uh, January 1, 1970, is the convention, plus 7 times 24. Times, so what is that probably doing? How long is this cookie supposed to live for? Seven days. Yeah, so seven days, but it looks like time, seven days, 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. So that's where I got that math from. All right, so what that means is I am planting inside the computer's hard drive somewhere a text file. Inside that text file is a key value pair. The key is user. The value is whatever the user's username is, and it should live for seven days. So what are the effects of this? Well, let me see. Let me go back to login three. All right, I'm currently not logged in. I'm going to go ahead and type jharvard. I'm going to type crimson. And I'm going to log in successfully. So that's good. I'm logged in successfully. I'm going to close my browser window. Normally, that would log me out because the session variable is meant to be ephemeral. When you close the browser window, restart for the night, or anything like that, it goes away. So it's not persistent. It's memory only. Let me reload this file. Oh, interesting. I am still logged in. So I seem to have done that somehow uh, using cookies. And in fact, let me go to version 3 here. And I've actually. Can log in again just to prove that we're actually still interfacing with the code properly, and we are. So let's see. This is login3.php. So let's see what's going on down here. Wait a minute. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. You go. There we go. Always. Ta -ta. Let's do this once more. Login3. J Harvard. Crimson. Login. Okay, I'm logged in. Copy this URL. New window. Version 3. There we go. OK. So I didn't see it. So I forgot that it turned off cookies. So in fact, our hypothesis earlier seems to be correct. It had temporarily disabled file-based cookies, which means set cookie did not work, the one I was calling. But now it's working again. So the motivation for this example was I actually didn't want to remember that the user was logged in. But rather, I want to remember what their username is so that a la Facebook, if you use Facebook, log in, and you then 
log, or you close the window, you shut down, but you come back the next day, it's really handy that your email address by default is still in there in the email address field, so you just have to type in your password. Assuming you didn't do this in a lab or an internet cafe, it's useful to just kind of have that waiting there for you. So I can't just grab this value from dollar sign underscore post. Why is that? Because that's what I did the last time I wanted this feature of re remembrance. Right, I didn't post it. I just visited this URL. I didn't try logging in and screw up. I just visited this URL. So this is presumably coming from a cookie that's been stored on the user's computer. So let's take a look. This is version 3. And here now is my little uh, table with username and password. It does wrap onto two lines, but let's see. Here's the field called user. It's of type text. Its default value is going to be the following. Oh, so this is that ternary operator that some languages have. This is like an if-else condition. So if post, quote unquote, user is set, what value do I spit out using the question mark colon operator? Yeah. So if the username is set in post, the assumption is the user did, in fact, just post information to get here. Otherwise, that would not be here. So let me go ahead and show that data again, because the uh, assumption is they screwed up their password. But if that's not set and I didn't get here by way of post, what am I outputting instead? Yeah, so cookie. So dollar sign underscore cookie is another super global that you can put anything you want in it, but you put stuff in it by way of the set, uh, the set cookie function. So it's slightly different usage on the setting side, but the getting side is identical to what we've been doing for get, post, and session. Yeah? And if it's neither, if it's neither, it's in fact the empty string. Yep, because uh, it, what it will do by default is print out the value in the cookie field, but it's just going to be quote unquote. And I'm being a little sloppy here just to keep some of the code simple. You'll find that right now we have errors and warnings disabled. I'm actually doing some things by trying to print values that might not exist, in which case by default you might actually get some warnings, but we'll re-enable those before long. Yes? Okay. And irrespective of any time we set here, uh, will the logout page destroy the cookie? I mean, we, we did set time minus 3,600. Mm -hmm. So will that work irrespective of the time here? The browser okay. should expire the cookie. Yes. So, I mean, you can, you can only tell the browser what to do. You can't enforce that the browser actually does it. So um, you... <laughs> So cookies ultimately boil down to some form of trust. So absolutely, so a user could keep a cookie around in perpetuity. It's then up to you as to whether or not you want this to actually be usable after some amount of time. Though frankly, to defend against a user kind of ignoring your expiries um, is kind of non-trivial. You have to start writing a bunch of code to work around this using some clever tricks. So. Okay. And the logout, in the logout page, we have uh, something which deletes the cookie. Uh, not that cookie. It deletes the session cookie. It okay. deletes this only. I didn't bother deleting this cookie anywhere. Okay. Okay. And let me try one thing here. I'm getting a little daring yet again, but we'll see. Uh, let's see. Login 3, display, uh, error, re reporting, uh, e all. There we go. OK. So I promised that we would reveal some of the warnings and errors that I'm kind of being a little loose with. And here's one of them. So this is the same code, login3.php. But on the server side, in php.ini, um, we currently have for our site warnings and errors disabled so that they don't get sent to the page. And this is largely a security thing because if we make a mistake in our code, you know, that's bad, but we really don't want to inform the whole world precisely what the problem is just in case it's a bad enough mistake that a bad person could exploit it in some way, inject data into our database, delete stuff. It's just none of their business if there is in fact a mistake useful for us in the log files not for them. So by default, what we do for the courses code is we say something like this. Um, there are a number of environment variables you can set in PHP and on many web servers, one of which is called display errors. And by calling INI set with the underscore, you can set change the values of certain keys that are in PHP.ini. 
And again, that's a config file that for the course you don't really have control over, but if you've downloaded XAMPP or the like to your own computer to run your own web server, you have control over this. This is a way of at runtime changing some of those settings. So I'm setting here the display of errors to false. I don't want to see anything except maybe in my logs, but what I just did for the sake of discussion was I set it to true and I specified, you know what I want you, PHP, to report? Everything. So E underscore all is a constant defined in PHP that says show me absolutely every stupid little mistake that I might have made. In PHP, as in many programs and languages, there's at least three levels of, uh, of problems. Notices, which are, you're being a little sloppy here, this really isn't a huge deal, but let me tell you about it anyway. So that's a notice. A warning is you're really doing something wrong here. Your code will probably work, but maybe in a slightly unintended way. And then there's an error, which is I'm not even going to execute this code for you. It's so bad. So those are the three levels of it. What I will say in practice, a lot of people disable notices, but leave on errors and warnings. Um, but sort of a very anal programmer will actually leave all such errors enabled but fix all of their actual problems. So with that said, why am I getting some kind of error? So I've just reloaded and I get this weird HTML inside of the page here. Well, why is that? Well, let me look at the source of what's going on here. And now notice, apparently I'm spitting out or someone's spitting out this notice with a bold facing in the middle of my form. What induced the printing of this error message? Undefined index, user. So there is no, what? So there's no cookie. So remember, inside of my little snippet of HTML there, I said, I used the ternary operator. And just for those who have uh, perhaps less experience, if you do something like this, echo either, let's, what do we say, uh, is set dollar sign underscore post bracket quote unquote user quote unquote question mark. Uh, dollar sign underscore post. It's a lot faster to type this, but we'll do this just once. Colon dollar sign underscore cookie quote unquote user. So this is a ternary operator. It takes three operands, left, middle, and right. And what this is equivalent to, and I really don't want to write the whole thing out now, but is equivalent to if, we'll call that x, if x, then, I don't know if I'm doing a service here. We'll try this and then answer questions, z. If x, then y, else z. So this clever one-line trick, which I've written on two lines just because it's long, is the identical to saying if x is true, if this is expression is true, then do the stuff after the question mark, which I've called y here. Else, if this is not true, do what's after the colon, which is this thing here. So what this did for us in login 3 was it allowed us to conditionally spit out one of two values, either the value inside of dollar sign underscore post user or the value inside of the cookie. But there's a problem. There's kind of a third case. There's either a value in post or there's a value in, user, in cookie or neither, right? There's kind of this third case. Now, in this code, I just kind of blindly print out the value of the user key in the cookie super global if there's not one in post. But if there's no cookie set, then the function called is set would actually return not true but false for cookie bracket user. So what I'm actually seeing is PHP being really pedantic and saying, you know what, you are printing the contents of dollar sign underscore cookie, bracket quote unquote user, but there is no key there. So FYI, notice undefined index, an undefined key inside the quotes. So this is useful because one, this is a mistake. Maybe I didn't realize there is this third case, so to speak. So I should probably address that in some way. Frankly, if I know full well that that's going to happen and I just don't care, I prefer being able to write this all on one line. There's a few ways to suppress this. You can actually say with an at sign, this is the warning suppression operator in PHP, you can say, I know full well, I'm a smart person, that this piece of code might actually trigger a notice. Just shut up. I don't want to hear about it. And you can sort of actively embrace the fact that you know this isn't perfectly rigorous, but you can suppress the notice anyway, which frankly is probably not such a big deal. It's not a security concern in this context, and it avoids you having to add yet another condition to your code, which itself then 
you know, is a trade-off between readability and actual, actual correctness. So this will, should suppress, whoops, uh, let me go back, put it in the wrong place in this context. No, I didn't. Damn it. Uh, uh, echo post user. Oh, wait. It was yelling about that one. Uh huh. And now. OK. So there are cases where now, if you're starting to suppress it here and here, it's one of those like leaky logs where now all these different errors are popping up. So maybe not the cleanest approach altogether. But what I did was effectively squelch those notices because I'm actively saying, I know there might not be a value here, but it's a little more convenient than actually checking myself. So you will find throughout PHP code sort of two fundamental approaches to checking whether some value is present. This approach here with is is set is probably the most correct because you are actively checking before ever using this key if it's actually set with this PHP is set function. So let me actually now show what someone might also do, which is reasonable but not necessarily correct. It feels like, logically, this should also return true or false as is appropriate. So unless the user's name is zero or their password is zero, probably not going to be allowed anyway, logically. This would be maybe the way you normally write a condition like this. If there's some non-zero value here and there's some non-zero value here, go ahead and proceed. But now what you'll see is that uh, in the, I rolled back all my changes just so we would only see one at once. Display errors true and then error reporting e underscore all. Come on. There we go. So now I'm actually seeing it not inside a form, which is why it was appearing in the text area. Now I actually see it in my code, undefined index user. So what, what's one approach to fix it in this context up here? So I could do this at sign here and here. And frankly, this is kind of reasonable, I think, in this context, because it's a little more readable and a little more fun to do than constantly calling this function here, which frankly just makes your lines longer. It just gets a little tedious to type, and frankly takes a little bit of the fun out of doing something that's relatively simple. Um, or there's another approach altogether. So let me actually roll back to this. We could, you know what, warnings and errors I like, but you know what, let me go ahead and disable notices. So E underscore notice is a constant representing notices. A caret sign represents, anyone know what operator? Or. Uh, not or. Not. Not, uh, not, XOR. So this is the XOR operator. And these are actually bit, bit flags if you're um, familiar with this general approach. So this is saying, give me all errors except for notices. And this, too, is fairly common. Um, so it's really up to you which one you embrace. I would say sort of pedagogically, I tend to use is set as often as possible. But in my own code, I tend to suppress things that just keep my code cleaner and leaner. Leaving notices in your code, very bad. You don't want to, for instance, so when writing library code, taking this approach that I just did in the last case, this is not good because it's presumptuous of you to assume that you can enforce server side settings on other people using your code. Right? It just might not fly. So it's either best to use is set everywhere or to actually suppress things with the at operator. All right. And finally, let me roll this back. And finally, let me pull up this one. And this is a bad idea. This is version four and final for today. Why? Yeah, so this is saving the username and the password in a client-side cookie, which means someone with some free time and curiosity can just start poking around this person's hard drive, whether it's an internet cafe or their own computer, and actually stored in the cookie is going to be the username and password. And I'm abusing this capability of cookies, because notice, if username and password are valid, log user back in, you know, yes, this would work. Check the username that I put in the cookie. Check the password that I checked in the cookie. But again, very easily avoided, as we've seen, and just a general bad practice, but more on that when we focus on things security related. Any questions? Oh, really good question. Short answer, yes. Can you have name collision using cookies within the same domain? Yes. So the fact that you all have your own domains that you bought from GoDaddy is a very good thing, because even though we're all on the same server, cookies are associated with the actual domain name. So foo.com and bar.com have separate cookie spaces. We, for instance, would run into a problem in the course if we took 
the non-domain approach. And like a lot of courses or servers said, you know what, you all have accounts on CS75.net, but your accounts or your websites are in tilde, say, mailin. And took this tilde approach using public HTML directories, because then if you ever set cookies, they would be in our domain. Or conversely, they'd be in your fellow students' domains, which then you could start looking at each other's cookies and sort of wreaking havoc unintentionally on each other's sites. But it's not a problem here. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, it's a good question. How easy is it to forge a cookie that says authenticated true? So you can't forge the value of authenticated because that is literally stored server side. You can forge or guess PHP sesh ID. This is trivial if the website is not using SSL. Like we could, as a class exercise, go to Starbucks with laptops and log in to people's Facebook accounts relatively easily just by doing what we called last week session hijacking. Stealing the value of PHP sesh ID, which if there's no SSL is just going back and forth across the wire. And then we, just using various Firefox tricks or command line utilities, just present to Facebook, this is our cookie value. Do something with it. Now maybe Facebook and other sites have some protections. Maybe they're screening based on IP address. But if we're at Starbucks or in any home network, odds are we appear to the world as having the same public IP address. So the reality is session hijacking is pretty easy. And so any reputable site like banking or uh, financial trading, I mean, it's all SSL, even the stupidest of pages, to avoid that problem. Other questions? It's scary, so enjoy your time at Starbucks next time. OK, let's take a five minute break. All right, so those of you who got a really eager start on Project One and started reading through it and uh, diving in might have realized that I didn't actually include the menu, uh, which is the crux of the whole project. So I did just post it, so I'm still safe because lecture is not yet ended. So realize that on the projects page, if you already downloaded the PDF for the assignment, uh, yes, that's still there, the specification, but the menu is now also live. And I will append it to the actual PDF after tonight. Um, but this is what the PDF looks like. So this was three aces, uh, rest in peace. Uh, really good pizzeria place up the road and they've got a whole they had a whole bunch of stuff so we will nonetheless honor them by implemented in memo, implementing in memoriam uh, their uh, e-commerce type website. But what you'll find is there's some curious corner cases that you may or may not decide to actually dive into. So there's a lot of data here. And as I assured last week, this is not meant to be an exercise in tedium. You don't have to implement every damn item on the menu. We just expect three or more elements from each of the categories. And there's about 10 categories in blue there. But you'll see some logically weird things that if you were in fact a programmer trying to deal with this menu for real, um, things don't follow a pattern. Like uh, apparently under pizzas we have small price, large price, small, large, small, large, small, large. And these are actual pizzas and then you get to the bottom row, extra cheese, which is semantically kind of in the wrong place here because that is not a large pizza and a small pizza because you can't really probably order just extra cheese and have that delivered to you. So you'll trip over things like this that, you know, frankly in the real world, for a real world pizzeria is totally reasonable, right? Any intelligent, semi-intelligent human can figure out what that means. But computers are not so bright, relatively speaking. They can't just infer from you know, common sense. So you'll realize that there are perhaps some non-obvious design decisions to be made. But you don't necessarily have to bite off all of those. Um, the mechanism with which you implement a website via which people can order items from these menus is left largely to your design. Um, clearly, do you have things like select menus at your disposal and check boxes and radio buttons and submit buttons and text fields that will be largely left up to you. One of the things Sid will do tonight is, is discuss how you might go about modeling this data in this thing called XML, which we'll introduce uh, in just a moment, um, and how you might generally go about tackling the project itself. Um, for those of you with uh, lesser programming backgrounds do realize that this is definitely a non-trivial step up from project one, which was really just mechanical, getting yourself up and running. So realize that for those of you with less backgrounds, I would really dive in ASAP. And even if you're not staying around tonight for section, watch that video uh, within 48 hours when it gets posted and engage us in discussions on the bulletin board or email if you're, you're struggling or worried with any of this. With that said, it should be rather fun um, and fairly real world as well, especially since you're actually getting your hands dirty with some actual real world data. So what is the approach you'll ultimately take to model this data? 
this thing called XML. So this stuff, if you've never used it before, looks a lot like HTML or XHTML. But XML is kind of like make your own HTML. You can make up your own tag names. You can make up your own attribute names. And in fact, there are formal ways of specifying what your flavor of XML looks like with something called the DTD or a schema. We won't go into that level of rigor in this particular course, but realize that there are some additional layers of formality out there that are actually um, rather interesting to consider, but we're going to keep it simple. So here's a snippet of XML. This is a um, this might be part of a database, so to speak, if, if loosely defined. But what is this fragment of XML, even if you've never seen this stuff, apparently encoding or representing? Da okay, data. OK, that's, <laughs> that's pretty weak. OK, give me one. OK, an order of some sort, so a book order. So there's a lot of computers out there these days that exchange information. Amazon.com, for instance, has all those third-party vendors that somehow have to communicate. And one of the most common ways that they do so these days is using XML as kind of a transport mechanism. They need to send data from one system to another. And there's a lot of databases in this world, MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft Access, uh, Oracle, and a whole bunch of others. Kind of annoying if Amazon wants to interface with a third party and they don't have the same data Database engines, they can't necessarily just share copies of their database. They need to speak in some intermediate format. And one such format that's increasingly used commonly is XML. It's just text, but data can be tagged in a way that can then be imported on the other side and it can be exported very easily. And it's increasingly used as configuration files for programs instead of coming up with your, so Apache's HTTP.conf, completely proprietary format and not proprietary in the intellectually interesting sense, but just they came up with their own arbitrary format. PHP.ini, completely arbitrary as well. And many, many, many examples of this exist. It's really useful that applications are increasingly using XML because it means they, or I, the programmer, don't have to write code that parses the configuration file. There are what are called XML parsers or processors, which are just libraries, freely available that you can download, that will analyze this file for you and essentially hand you all of the interesting data, as you pointed out to you in the form of variables or an object. So it's just another wheel that you need not invent. So we're going to use it in the, for more of that latter purpose to represent data as though it's in a database, but in a database that doesn't require special software. It just requires a text editor and sort of a, a good design decision. So this order does allow us to introduce a few concepts that I'll rattle off, most of which you're familiar from XHTML. But this thing here, order, for instance, is called an element, but it's an element uh, in this sense that it's everything from there to the close tag. So we might call this a start tag, this an end tag. An element is order and everything that descends from it. It's the whole object in memory. OK, a child element, like sold to, is just conceptually a child of that element. It's indented, which is not necessary in terms of code, but it's visually useful for humans, this pretty printing. Uh, what else we got? We got attributes and values in XML, just like in XHTML, because XHTML is an XML compliant version of HTML. Any attributes have to be quoted with single or double quotes. On any tag that you open, you must close symmetrically. But there is no requirement in XML itself about capitalization. You need to be consistent using uppercase and uppercase, or lowercase and lowercase. But it doesn't have to all be lowercase, as it must for XHTML. So another distinction there. So this is a format that someone came up with to represent a book order, in this case of Harry Potter specifically. You, for your database of pizza and subs and whatnot, will come up with something similar. Um, well, another piece of jargon, this thing at the top here, order in this context, is what's called a root element. So you're going to come up with your own root elements. You're not going to call it HTML, because that doesn't make all that much sense for a menu. You might call it open bracket, M-E-N-U, close bracket, and then some stuff under underneath there. Maybe category, open bracket, and so forth. So there's an infinite number of ways that you can do this. But one of the upsides of XML is its quote unquote extensibility. So XML is extensible markup language. Markup language means it's not a programming language. It means it's a semantic uh, markup tool, which means you can kind of tag your words or your data in, with little hints, tags, open bracket, close bracket, that tells a processor or program why this data is interesting, what type of data is it is. So what's useful about the X in XML 
is that you can add features to your XML documents usually without breaking everything else. You can extend it to provide more detail, but if so long as the software using the file is written intelligently, adding more fields like a middle initial and an address field does not break the program's parsing of the rest of the data because it will still parse person and first name and last name and sold to and sold on correctly. It just so happens that now it can also consume some additional data. And this is hugely advantageous because it means, unlike yesteryear, where once you choose your file format, you better adhere to that because otherwise sender or receiver will probably break. XML is a lot more flexible by design. And this is a huge upside. The fact that XML is human readable, too, is one of its selling points. So this might strike some of you, especially if you've been doing this for years, as really the worst possible way of transmitting data across the wire. It's verbose. I have long names. I'm wasting so many bytes because of the redundancy of the tag names and all of that. And that is all very true and valid. The reality is that people have higher bandwidths these days. Our CPUs are ridiculously fast these days. I mean, if ever there were a time where we can afford to spend some additional space and time on processing data like this, we're kind of at that point. And so it's a trade-off. It's humanly readable, which itself is useful de uh, during development and debugging. And it has all of these other features as well. And it's fairly versatile. You can come up with an arbitrary object or uh, hierarchical structure. So let's talk concrete. So this is a full document, an XML document, has a bunch of possible components. Let's tease these apart so that you have the vocabulary, the jargon, that'll be useful not only for this class, but frankly in many other programming contexts, whether it's PHP, JavaScript, or most any other high-level language these days. So hopefully this stuff will serve you well even beyond the course. So this is a representative document. It's pretty arbitrary, but it's meant to represent like a student's database. Okay? So maybe this is uh, used by a very small registrar that doesn't have thousands or millions of students in their database, you know, just a few hundred, where it's fine to store it in XML because it's plenty fast to parse this. Um, or maybe this is Harvard's way of dumping their own database so that it can be imported into someone else's system or another school's system. XML is sort of a nice middleman format. So there's a few features of this that we'll tease apart. Notice that the ellipsis here just means eh, it's not interesting to talk about two students. We'll just focus on the one. But they're probably there if this is a database. So the very thing at top, and what you might find useful in your slides tonight is to keep the original uh, full document handy, because what we'll see now is we'll focus on little pieces, and then we'll transition to a programmatic look at XML and what PHP can do with XML. So in that representative document, there's this thing called the XML declaration at top. Unfortunately, this looks like PHP because of the open bracket question mark. Um, frankly, this is optional by definition of XML. And in the context of PHP, you might as well omit it altogether because it just confuses the parser. And if you want to spit this thing out, you have to resort to an echo statement or a print statement. You can't just put it in the file because PHP will confuse it for actual PHP code. Minor annoyance, but frankly, it's not necessary. And unless you're doing things with non-UTF encodings or non-English encodings or non-Romance language encodings, odds are it doesn't even matter. You don't need this. It's optional. But what it does do is it tells the program using this file what version of XML you're using, uh, what the encoding actually is, in this case, UTF-8. Um, and it's meant to be a, some hints to the processor as to how to handle this file. But it's not strictly necessary. And frankly, for this course, I would typically just leave it off because of the PHP nuisance. All right, so an element. Here's a sample element, except that at top right, we had this element called name. Uh, the child of that is a string called Jim Bob. And what is interesting about an XML element? Well, XML paid files are pretty much boiled down to elements. Every XML file has to have at least one element called the root element. That's the very one at top. Just like XHTML documents have an HTML root element, so must every XML document have at least one element called the root element, inside of which, or nested inside of which, is everything else. So an element is defined by a start tag, open bracket, students, and then zero or more attributes. If there are attributes, they have to be separated by spaces, one space, two spaces, 10 spaces, whatever, but space. And each of them must follow the pattern of Attribute equals value, quote unquote. Attribute equals value, quote unquote. You can have spaces before and after the equal sign, though it's pretty much unnecessary and kind of ugly if you tend to. Um, but you can, and you may only have uh, one attribute of a given name for a given element. So you can have an ID attribute here. You can't have another ID attribute on the same element. You can have a foo attribute and a bar. You can have an infinite number of attributes, but none of them can have the same name on the same element. Yeah. And then here. 
it's called a text node. Yeah, and we'll see a little depiction of, will we? Yes, we will. Um, it's Jim Bob is what's called a text node because as we'll see, and as you might realize already, XML can actually be implemented in memory as a tree. So Jim Bob is actually going to be a leaf in that tree. Yeah. How do you prevent duplicate uh, IDs? Like, Manually. Are you using that as a primary ID? Yes. Yeah, so XML. So how do you prevent duplication of IDs? So in XML, um, there is a special. So and again, this is more detailed than we'll tend to spend time on in the course. XML doesn't really have data types, but it kind of does, but they're fairly generic. Like there is an ID token data type. There is a name token data type. And IDs are meant by definition to be unique. The only way to enforce that though, if you're making XML, is manually or with your own computer program. There's no sort of automatic way. Um, it's really up to you. Um, but again, we'll keep it fairly high level here. So worry less about those details. But if you do define IDs, they should be unique, but you've got to figure out how to do it. OK, so n tags, as you, might, uh, as you might realize or have already inferred, they pretty much have to be the opposite of the start tag. The slash means close the tag here, but the nesting level, the symmetry, the name, the casing, all of that must be identical. And notice, you do not put attributes in the n tags. They don't belong there at all, just in the start tags. And here, just as uh, FYI, not terribly interesting, there are constraints on what names you can give to XML elements. And there they are in the last bullet there. So essentially, words are fine, but then there's some gotchas with some punctuation stuff. OK, so with respect to elements, there are four content models you can associate with them. And I'm trying to use the proper jargon here, although for the course, you're not really going to have to whip out these terms very often, but it is the way they're typically described. So an element can have element content. That is, it can have one or more children that themselves are elements. Case in point, the student element has a status child, as you can see from your whole XML document. You can have PC data, otherwise known as parsed character data, or just text, which means that you can have a name tag, then Jim Bob, which is text or PC data, followed by close name. PC data, we'll see in a moment, is in contrast to C data, which is not parsed. So you know already from XHTML there's some dangerous characters. Ampersands give us trouble. Open brackets give us trouble. If they only give us trouble, though, if they are parsed. So there is a way, as you may already know from web page design, to declare a C data section, which means here comes some text. Don't parse this, because if you do, you're going to get confused probably by some weird characters. So you might have even used that in web page design. There's mixed content. You can have an element called name, inside of which is PC data and other element content. And we've seen this. I mean, if you've ever written an XHTML paragraph tag, open bracket P, close bracket, then some text, you probably have like some bold facing in there, some italics in there. So that's an example of mixed content. You're just intermingling text and other elements. And then finally, there's no content. An element that is both uh, opened and closed within the same syntactic structure. And you can still have attributes in there, but there's just no children. And you've seen this in XHTML in what context? What elements have uh, no content? Sorry? Horizontal line. HR, BR. And there's a, there's a few. Not many, but there's a few. Now, it is equally correct to say, even in XHTML, BR, open bracket, close bracket, BR, so long as you put no space here, this just arguably looks stupid, um, is all. Some programs will automatically spit this out. And it is not wrong by any means. But it looks stupid, arguably, and it's just a waste of bytes. And so most people will make that, uh, condense it into this form here. In the world of XHTML, but not really in XML, people will usually leave a space here, although this is decreasingly necessary. Because some browsers, if they don't understand this notation, a browser might not know what br slash is, but it will know what br is. And then if it sees space slash, the only part it's going to ignore is this, but it will still understand the BR. But frankly, in 2009, this should be decreasingly necessary. Although you'll see in my code, I still do it out of habit. There's no downside other than the waste of a byte. OK, attributes. So attributes, and this will lead to an interesting design question, both for class and also projects, are another way of embodying data in a document. Sorry, quick question. Mm -hmm. You have text within an element. Do you have anything other than text? Uh, like what?
Oh, OK. So can you enforce constraints on what kinds of children an element has? So yes, but to do that, you need to uh, employ what's called a DTD, or an XML schema, which is essentially uh, two different languages that you can embed inside or outside of this file that a parser, an XML parser, has to be told, validate this file, this XML, against this DTD or schema, and reject its usage if it violates the latter. So we won't bother with that. Again, it's, it's actually a fairly sophisticated concept, although DTDs are relatively simple but relatively weak. But short answer, yes, there's a way to enforce constraints. Um, we will not bother with them. And frankly, for most of the uh, small uses for XML or the sort of personal uses of XML, like for this project, for our config files for the website, it really doesn't add anything to impose constraints on yourself if you're the one writing the code yourself. But in the real world, yes, someone like Amazon would have a schema or DTD that says this is what a purchase order looks like. OK, so attributes, um, really not all that interesting because you've used these so many, many times with XHTML. But FYI, attributes values cannot contain open bracket or ampersands per the last bullet there. And there are some constraints on what has to be inside of them. But for the most part, it's, it's common sense because you've been doing it for web pages for some time. So PC data. PC data means parsed character data, which means it should not, cannot have um, dangerous characters like open bracket and ampersand unless you escape them using those things called entities. More on that in just a moment. Um, but PC data is what almost anything an XML file or an XHTML page are if it's outside of tags. It's PC data by nature. Entities. So in XML, there are only five predefined entities. NBSP is not one of them, just FYI, even though that's pretty common in the HTML world. So the five entities that you get for free anytime you're writing an XML document are the parser will understand ampersand amp, semicolon, LT, GT, APOS, and quote. Um, just a quick review, amp represents ampersand. Right. OK, and so for the camera, ampersand, less than, greater than, apostrophe, or single quote, and quote, which is double quote. So those are the five ones that might otherwise be a little scary to a parser. So out of the box with XML, the parser will know what all of those mean. There's many others you can use, but you can use their numeric codes for them. All of them have codes. For instance, one I often use in a web page design is if I want to do an end dash, which is something that's a little longer than a hyphen. This is ampersand sharp sign 811 semicolon, and then if you want an M dash, which is even longer than that, this is, for instance, ampersand hyphen 812 semicolon, and I just looked those up in a chart. Yep. Oh, thank you. All right, I thought that looked weird. 8211, 8212. Perfect. OK, so FYI, those are not named entities, those, those are numeric entities. OK, so how do you declare other entities? In fact, in the context of XML, you can define your own entities. And this is not really going to prove necessary in this course. But just so you would know for completeness, the syntax for defining an entity happens to look like that. And that's how I could make NBSP work in an XML-based program, just FYI. OK, so C data. You may have used C data in the context of making a web page. What have you used C data sections for, perhaps? So JavaScript. So if you have JavaScript, which might very well have some arithmetic, like less than or greater than, that's kind of bad news for XML. And so often when you write uh, JavaScript in a web page, you will escape it using a C data section, which unfortunately looks like this scary mess up top. But just to show you what the syntax is, let me stop writing on the board so I can avoid my own bad handwriting. Uh, it's going to be like this. If I know, if I have, uh, so out of context here, whoops. Uh, so if I, out of context here, have my body of a web page, close body, and then some close HTML, and I want to include some JavaScript, I can do script type equals text slash JavaScript. Let me make this a little bigger. And then down here, I have script. But it's problematic if I then have some JavaScript code like, well, if x is less than 3, then do something like document.write x is less than 3. OK, so something stupid like this is actually dangerous, or at least confusing to the parser, because I have this less than sign there in the context of what's PC data. So if I want to tell the browser, treat the following as C data, 
that is non-parse data, the convention the world adopted is to say open bracket, bang, open bracket, C data, open bracket. And then, just to avoid confusing the JavaScript parser, will you typically do slash slash there so that you don't confuse the JavaScript parser built into the browser. Then down here, you do that. So it looks stupid. But essentially, the world decided who in their right mind is ever going to need to type this sequence of commands. Let's use that ourselves for the escaping process. Um, frankly, it took me like three years to actually memorize that sequence of characters. Um, maybe you're brighter than I am um, when it comes to remembering these things. But that's all it is. And that's actually related to the underlying um, implementation of XHTML as XML. So we have to avoid this constraint. So this is very useful, though, if you want to include JavaScript or literal HTML uh, inside of a scripting context or any place where you might introduce some worrisome characters, C data to the rescue. Now, with that said, um, there's a fine line between using C data properly and just escaping something because you're lazy and don't want to avoid even thinking about what's going in the code. So it should really be used conservatively and only as necessary as a matter of principle. These are not interesting. You've used them, comments, but they exist in XML. If you want to comment code, not for the program to see, but for humans to see, it's this syntax here, open bracket, bang, uh, hyphen, hyphen. The only nuisance, I would say, with comments in XML and HTML are that uh, you can do this up here, this down here, but you cannot, for instance, do something like this, um, which sometimes does get annoying. They can't be nested. You have to get rid of one pair there to avoid confusing it. Or you have to do stupid things like put a space in there so that you really don't confuse the browser. So I say this is annoying because even in our XML files that we use for the website, we often comment things out because the video is not ready. But we write the code in advance so that we can very quickly post the video when it's ready. And even I have tripped over this nuisance of commenting out this chunk and this chunk. Now I want to comment out all this chunk. And you can't do it just because of this unfortunate constraint. So you run into silly little workflow things like that. All right. Finally, uh, PHP. So that was XML. So I actually used to teach a course at DCE where we spent a whole semester on that stuff in the context of Java, but we've just done our world one tour. So we have the basics. So who cares? What can we actually do with this? Well, in project one, are you going to use these basic building blocks, which for the most part you can reason through intuitively, irrespective of all the formalities we just posed, and come up with a model for your data? Now, what do we mean by that? Well, how might I represent a lecture? Well, let me go ahead and go uh, into a text editor. I'll use Vim here. Um, let me do lectures.xml. And let's say I have a lectures root element. I'm not going to bother with the XML declaration because it's not necessary. And now I have this. I'll zoom in. All right, so now I need to represent tonight's lecture. Well, let's call it a lecture. Um, lecture, how about? We can give it uh, an ID. Uh, well, let's give it a number. This is lecture three, zero indexed. OK, I don't really remember much about it yet, so let's just close this element in advance. The white space does not matter. I'm just keeping it kind of neat for my own sake. Whoops. OK, so now we have this. Now, what's associated with this lecture? Well, we've sort of. Uh, for a kick's sake, been giving them all titles or names. Doesn't really matter what we call it. But tonight was called XML. Uh, what else do they have? They have a date. Uh, so this is maybe, what are we at? 28 September? Is that right? 2009? Okay. So notice, I could be even more anal here, right? With XML, you have the ability to semantically tag your data. So if I really wanted to get obsessive here, I could say something like day is 28. And then month. I mean, this really quickly starts to take the fun out of XML, especially if you don't care. And for whipping up the course's web page, I really don't care to distinguish 28 from September from 2009. But realize that's among the things you can do is semantically tag all of this PC data. But we'll keep it broadly uh, defined up there. Now, what might we have? Uh, well, associated with each lecture, we might have a bunch of resources. That is the links that we actually associate with them on the page. So I'm going to anticipate that. What resource do we have? Well, let's kind of reverse engineer things. Let me go over to the website's lectures page. Looks like for tonight, we have one called slides. So let's call this name equals slides, and then uh, href. I could call these things anything I want, just trying to go with some form of conventions. Looks like PDF is in the directory called 3 slash lectures.pdf. Uh, I don't really need any children of resource, so I'm just going to close it like that. I don't really need the space, so I'll just do that. And now we've got one other one, 
source code, and this is going to go to 3 slash source. And you know what, I'm going to cut some corners. Looks like I have two different formats here, both the index and the zip file. Eh, I'm not going to deal with that just yet. So we'll just keep it simple now. So now I have a file for lecture 3, and let me go ahead and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Let me at least, for the sake of looping, give me uh, lecture 2. That was called PHP continued. This was seven days ago, and this was lecture two. So here, and this actually speaks to the relative ease with which we update the website. A lot of copy-paste and a lot of just changing some numbers around, but no HTML. We never have to write it again. Yeah? Uh, good, good. That's actually a really good question to ask here. So why, and I actually, this is not quite the format we use ourselves. I just made this up on the fly based on what felt reasonable. But I did make some design decisions without even asking questions. Like, why an attribute for number? Why an attribute for name and href? And yet, why an element for title? So what do you sense maybe instinctively should motivate choosing attributes versus child elements? Any thoughts? Okay, so child elements might need to be displayed somewhere. Okay, so there might just be some fundamentally different use for them. Sure. Okay, so chi children. Yeah, do you mind said um, putting an end to the thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so chi children can be extended later. You have a little more flexibility, whereas an attribute, kind of the buck stops here, right? There's no nesting possible within attributes, right? Because it's something quote unquote. There's really no way of extending that later or adding hierarchy. Other thoughts? Okay. Okay. Oh, that's a good rule of thumb. So you can think of child elements as being sort of nouns, objects, or entities that kind of have some meat to them, whereas at, uh, attributes are adjectives, which are sort of shorter pieces of data. Sure, I've never thought of it like that, but that actually sounds like a useful rule of thumb. And the short answer is there is really no one right answer here. So I would say, in general, if you have to represent a piece of data that really doesn't lend itself to extensibility, you're not really going to do much more with it, because once you have a number, that's it, then an attribute makes sense, right? There's really nothing more you're ever going to do with it. Keep it simple. And you'll find, too, programmatically, it tends to, in some languages, be easier to get at attributes than to get at children. Now, that's not always the case, but frankly, it just simplifies your code sometimes to use attributes. Um, so I could have put title up here accordingly, right? If titles really aren't going to change or need to be extended, so why not call this PHP comma continued? Um, you know what? Why not just put the date up here? Date equals, because that too, ugh, this is just a course config file. I'm never going to care to semantically break that apart. But what you'll find is that, especially if my fonts were um, bigger here, there comes a point now where you could start making everything attributes, and then you start to violate the readability of it all. And things start wrapping. It just gets a little ugly. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Those of you familiar with the Apache Ant build tool actually makes heavy, heavy use of attributes. And what they just do is they accept the fact that we have a lot of attributes. Some of them are long. So we just, whoops, uh, let me see if I can mimic their typical style. We, you know, we just do stuff like this. White space is ignored by XML parsers. So you just get really long elements like this, and they're OK with that. But it's a design decision. So short answer doesn't fundamentally matter unless you have some design goals you need to meet. I'm going to say that you know, number feels fairly atomic, fits very concisely in there. But for these other things, I'm going to go with child elements, too, just because. But not necessarily the right approach. Yeah. Good question. Um, must the structure of each lecture element be the same, or can they vary? Um, this is where it's more of a, I would uh, you should keep them the same. Because the whole point of XML is to define a structure that you can then assume subsequently. And if you start having like-named elements structurally different, that's kind of contrary to the whole spirit of all. Because then you have to sort of special case those differences in code. So I would say, yes, you can do it, but uh, you probably shouldn't. Especially if you start using DTDs and schemas, you can still tolerate it, but then it just makes it harder to specify what your format's supposed to look like if you have these different options for them. Yeah? Is there any like, uh, notion of like, having, having attributes keys into the data? 
that's a good, good question. Yes, I would say if you do have IDs or something like that that are meant to be keys into a database, an attribute is probably the place for it. With that said, there are some formats like RSS, which we'll look at briefly in a moment, which has a GUID field, which is a unique ID for an RSS element. And that ID, by convention, is a really long string. And that is defined not as an attribute, but as a child. So it can go both ways. You can make a reasonable argument probably in either direction. Really depends. OK, so with that said, let's do something with this. Well, let me go ahead, let me chmod this so I can take a look at it. That's lectures.xml. Let me go into my source directory here. And this is just how Firefox happens to render it. So Firefox and a bunch of browsers have this little clickability feature where you can kind of collapse things. This is not a feature of XML. This is just a visualization of it. So this is just Firefox's view of my data. And it's done some nice syntax highlighting. Well, what can PHP do for us now? Well, let me go ahead and whip up a little sample program. You'll see more of this in, in section um, this week and next. So I'm going to start writing a PHP file here. Um, and it turns out that there is this API in, XML, in PHP called Simple XML. And do peruse the documentation, even though you'll find that this is not so much a tutorial now, but just a reference guide of all of the functions that are available. Simple XML is a library that comes out of the box with relatively new versions of PHP that let you parse XML easily. Um, back in the day, parsing an XML file would mean I'd have to write a program that would have to open a file with a function like fopen, and I'd then have to iterate over every one of the characters in this file and somehow semantically um, parse this file so that it's not just a string of characters. Each of these things are objects with meanings and stuff like that. I mean, that's the uninteresting part. One of the reasons XML has gotten so popular is because so many languages come with libraries that parse it. Now, what does that mean? Well, the goal for me is going to be to tell the computer to transform the XML document into an object that I can manipulate and maybe even change. And the connection here now is to something called DOM. DOM is Document Object Model. You may have heard of this in the context of web pages, and we'll come back to it when we talk about JavaScript and AJAX. But this picture here is a tree representation, a la any data structures course, of that XML snippet up there. So a tree, as you are probably familiar if you've taken a data structures course, is just one of many. It's sort of like a, an, um, a family tree where the oldest person is at the root of the tree. In this case, the so-called root element is called students. And what we have here, though, is the true root of the DOM is by convention called the document node. So even though, and this is an annoying confusion, there's a root element in an XML document, but in a DOM, the root of the tree is a document node. This allows us to have other stuff at the top of a document. Notice here, the first thing in this XML document is not the root element called students. It's instead what? Comments. So if we're going to model this file, this text file as a tree, we need sort of an Uber node at the very top that's by convention called document, capital D, so that I can hang off of it as children, both a node representing the comment and a node representing the child. So now beneath this, and this is just one arbitrary pictorial representation of the XML fragment, we ultimately have a tree structure. So the, uh, for the root element here is this element called students. A student has a child itself called student. Student has how many children? Two, a little, slightly wrong, but we'll come back to that, called name and called status. And then those two each have one child, which is a text node, whose value in one case is Jim Bob, whose value in the other case is graduate. Now I say you're a bit wrong, and I'm a bit tolerant of the wrong answer by saying one child here, two child here, because clearly there's some other children that we've depicted. So, and you can kind of infer from the text in them, what are the other children of, say, students? Yeah, so there's a backslash n right after the close tag of students. Then there's a backslash t, a tab character. And then there's the child called student, right? So if I look very closely at students, there's actually a backslash n here, maybe backslash r, but we'll assume backslash n, then a backslash t, which does the indentation, and then the student element. Now, white space that's contiguous tends to be collapsed into just one node. So we have two children so thus far, a white space node and a student node. But then notice the student node ends here. What's probably after this, ba this angled bracket? Another new line, another backslash n. So in fact, the way I've interpreted this document here is that student, yes, is a child of students, but it's got two siblings, another, a text node on the left 
and a text node on the right. In practice, many XML parsers will throw away the white space because it's really not that interesting, but you have to tell it usually to throw away the white space. For our purposes, this won't really affect PHP, but just FYI, we're trying to be complete because this may come back to haunt us or help us in come JavaScript. Um, notice too that this is just, again, just a pictorial uh, discretion attributes, I've decided, to just hang off of the tree laterally. Now, that's not any standard there, but I'm just trying to show that the student element has an attribute called ID, and it really shouldn't go down below with an arrow, because that would kind of imply conceptually it's a child. So that's why I kind of arbitrarily but reasonably chose it uh, to hang off laterally. So the point, though, is that what simple XML is going to do for me is take something like the XML at top left and hand me something like that at top right. It's going to hand me a tree structure that I can then navigate. And the syntax we're about to see for navigating that tree will be very similar to pointer notation you've seen in C or C++ uh, or uh, yeah, in Java with references. Um, we're going to see lots of arrows, which even though we write them left to right in code, it's going to be like going top to bottom in this tree. And it'll allow us to navigate this document relatively easily. So with that said, Let's whip up a little example here. So I'm going to uh, cut some corners in terms, well, no, I don't have to cut some corners. Let me go ahead and steal some corners. Home.php, I'm going to call this lecture, uh, lectures.php. Uh, now I'm going to go through, just because I never remember doc types or all of this, I'm just going to steal it from here. And I'm going to get rid of everything in my body tag. I'm just going to call this lectures. OK, so now I have a well-formed HTML document that I'm now going to start using the simple XML API. So let's make do a little sanity check. Uh, lectures.php, good. I have a clean slate. My goal is to use this API to open that PHP, to, to open that XML file and spit out its contents, much like we do in reality at cs75.net slash lectures. I'm just going to do sort of a, a quick and dirty version of the same idea to show that using some looping constructs and using just some HTML const, uh, uh, tags and whatnot, we can produce the same idea here. And that will be useful because one, you're probably going to have to take your XML file and somehow render all of the menu options right in a one category or another. So it's uh, hopefully a stepping stone toward that. So let's see. Um, I'm going to put this at the top of my file, kind of by convention, if I don't want to spit out the raw content yet, but I need to do a little bit of processing. I'm going to do one of two things. So one, I can say XML, I can take an object-oriented approach, for those familiar. New, simple XML element. And then what I have to pass in is file, get contents, and then lectures.xml. Hopefully I got my syntax right here. So there is a class called simple XML element that comes with PHP. It takes as its uh, argument to its constructor a string, but a string of XML. How do I get a string of XML? Well, lectures.xml is a file, so consistent with the promise that, XML, uh, that PHP comes with a function for everything. File get contents, as the name suggests, gets contents of a file and returns all of them as one big string. So this is one approach to actually parsing the file. And let me make sure I got my syntax right. Good, OK, no errors. So now my page looks the same, but I do in fact have a tree structure in memory. And a, a trick I do like to do, just when I'm learning stuff or trying to look inside of stuff, just quick and dirty, never for production eyes, is to do something like this. Open bracket, uh, print r XML. Let's take a quick peek at what a string representation of this DOM is that simple XML is creating for me. OK, and it's going to be a little overwhelming at first because there's a lot of metadata in there. But the indentation alone should suggest that there's some kind of tree structure in there akin to this thing. So what is in there? Well, here is the first lecture child. Uh, it turns out that this is an array. So underneath the hood, what X simple XML is doing is it's going to give us the illusion of a tree. But some of these are implementation details that we shouldn't really be privy to, or we shouldn't write code based on this. But it's just a nice way of seeing what's inside a file. And I'll admit to doing this all the time just to see what's in a variable. But there's uh, an AP the API lets us use different notation for getting at that data. So I'm not going to just dump the contents. What I want to do is iterate over those lectures. So let's start with a baby step. Let me just spit out the uh, titles of the lectures as a list. All right, so let's see. Uh, here's some PHP code. I've already done my parsing of XML, so I'm going to comment this as parse XML file. And then down here, let's see, for each, uh, what do I want? XML for each lecture element. 
starting from the root of the tree. So the arrow notation says start at the root of the tree in the variable called XML, then follow it one step down to each lecture element. So what this syntax here does, thanks to some PHP trickery, is return an array of all elements called lecture that are children of the root elements. So that's what I'm getting with that. So for each lecture as uh, lecture, so this is just a hopefully familiar or soon to be familiar PHP construct, though I'm pretty sure I've used this before. What do I want to do? Well, let me go ahead and echo what? The current lecture's title. I don't remember how to do that. Let me do the number first. So to get it an attribute in XML using this API, you use the variable name in question, and then you use associative array syntax to get it the attribute called number. All right, now after this, you know what, I'm going to put in some curly braces because I need some line breaks to keep this kind of clean. And let me go ahead and echo out also a BR character. OK, let's go ahead and go back to my browser. Reload. OK, not that exciting, but thankfully I'm on the, I'm on the road here. So I have two and then three for those in back. Two and then three. OK, so that's kind of interesting, but let's make it a little more sophisticated. So lecture and then my concatenation operator, let me at least say something more interesting like we do on the website. OK, so getting better still. Now let's actually print out the title. So let me go ahead and maybe do, um, let's say, let's do the new line. And now let's say the lecture's title. So lecture title and then put a new line below that, maybe two new lines this time, just to separate things. Hmm, didn't work. So why did this not work? So it's not an attribute. Yep, good, so title's not an attribute. So we need to get out of the children. How did we take a step deeper into the tree a moment ago? Yeah, so let's try this. Get the title for the lecture. Ah, okay, so there we go. And again, we can commingle some, um, HTML and PHP, and again, this is where H, uh, PHP is out of the box, kind of a sloppy language. Like, I really am commingling my logic with my presentation here, but that's okay. Certainly for the first project, and frankly, kind of the way most people code PHP, you commingle these things. So even if it kind of rubs you the wrong way, it kind of rubs me the wrong way too, and there are ways to clean this up. There are template, uh, templating frameworks and all of that, but we're keeping it simple for now. But I am a little curious. I want to just make this a little prettier. So let me print out a, BR th a B tag there, and then echo B here. And I'm at least keeping my code somewhat clean, arguably. So, OK. So now it's getting a little interesting. Now let me, tr um, actually, it's not all that enlightening to print out the dates or anything like that. It's just following a pattern. But there is some juicy information in that XML file, like what? Sorry? The resources. So let's see for each lecture, can I print out those resources now? All right, so let's see how I might do this. So let me go ahead and do something like this. Um, let me go ahead and output an unordered list here, which will hopefully lend itself to printing out a bunch of resources. All right, so here's my ordered list. Now what do I want to print out iteratively? What kind of tags? So li, list item tags. All right, so I need to print out a one, zero or more li tags. So I'm going to do for each. Now I don't want to do this because this means go back to the start of the tree and now go find all of the resource elements, which I don't want to do. I want to do this relative to the current lecture. So I want to say start at the current lecture, get its resources, and then get its resource children. Call each iteratively resource. Could be anything I want. Now what do I want to do? Well, let's go ahead and echo a list item. Let me close that off so I don't forget. And now what do we want to print for each of these? Each resource is what? Do you remember? I don't. <laughs> Name and href. OK, so slides and source code, for instance. So let's see. Let's go ahead and print. It's not a child anymore, so it's the name. Yep, name and href. So let's just print the name and do a quick sanity check before we go too, uh, too far down an, a wrong road. I'm going to hit reload. Oh, so that's pretty good. Now, I, my white spacing's a little messed up, so I, I can kind of clean this, uh, let's see, lecture title. Oh, yeah. So that looks a little weird putting the title there. Let's put it up here, uh, echo br. And I will post this code online so that you needn't scribble it down. 
Okay, that looks a little better. Still some room for aesthetic improvement, but now I have two for loops, each one of which is iterating over the structure. Unfortunately, this really isn't useful to get at that content because I have an href. All right, so this is not a hard problem. I now want to spit out the href as well, but I want to do this as an anchor tag. So let's do open bracket a href. Now, how do I get at the resources href? So I could say resource bracket href, close bracket, quote, close that, close that, then do the name, then do close a. And hopefully some of you are desperately wanting to fix this. What's wrong here? <sighs> Qualified in what sense? Uh, well, let's see. We're iterating over all of the resource children iteratively, calling each one resource. So what that means, so what that means is, and let me pull up the XML real fast. Come on. What that means is we're iterating currently over each resource element. So that's okay. So the attribute is called name, and the attribute is called href. But there's some syntax problems here, right? So maybe some a backslash because we're, yeah, I mean, technically we kind of need that there at least because we're putting, um, yeah, this is just kind of all over the place. This one here, and even that's going to confuse the parser. So let me try to clean this up a little bit. So one way to handle what is ultimately boiling down to some quoting confusion, I can at least deploy some single quotes in there to at least avoid some confusion. But now I still have some double quotes. So remember, anytime you want to put a variable, its value inside of a quoted string, you can use the curly brace notation. It's not necessary if you're just printing out a variable called like resource, but if resource actually has some structure to it, as in this case, then you do need the curly braces so that the parser does not get confused. So this looks good. So now let me go back and reload. I indeed have some hyperlinks. Let me hover over them. If we look at the bottom, well, I can't hover and look over the bottom, but if we look at the bottom here, Looks like, okay, kind of a little bug because we're in lectures three and then I'm trying to go to source two lectures. But that's okay. That's just because of where I put the code and the relative URL is slightly off. But these things seem to now be working pretty well. So relatively easily, we've, one, come up with a data model in our XML file. And yet we tossed a lot of jargon out there, but it's kind of just kind of common sense. And yes, there's some design discretion, attribute versus a title. But the goal is to come up with a data model that works for you. So if you find, find it convenient to use attributes, go with attributes. Or uh, elements, go with elements. But now we've relatively easily used one line of code. And herein lies the power of libraries, frankly. The alternative approach, for those less familiar with this object-oriented approach of calling new and then a constructor, there's another function that you'll see in the documentation called simple XML load file. So this is equivalent. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you use, but both exist, and you'll see both in the documentation. It's like simple XML load file, and there's also another one called simple XML load string, if you already happen to have your XML in a string. But I'll just go back to this version arbitrarily, and again, I'll, um, I'll post this particular file online. But we can do some pretty neat things quickly, and in fact, this is particularly compelling when everyone seems to have RSS feeds these days. So one of the things that I did recently um, in the context of making some of these uh, sample programs is this thing, which I forget if I pulled, I don't think I pulled up last week, but this is meant to motivate this. So it turns out on Harvard's campus, there's a lot of publications, and I've only found some of them at the left-hand side here. But many of them have RSS feeds, and being a geek and being a teacher of this kind of stuff, I realized, wow, this is kind of fun. I could write a news aggregator of all of the articles on campus so that I personally, frankly, can just wake up in the morning, go to this site, and not have to check like half a dozen websites. And then I can do full text searches. I can search, I can Google myself on campus, see if anyone's talking about me, um, or just search for you know, other terms like what's going on today. Uh, let's see, uh, let's say uh, extension. Let's search for the keyword extension. And what I've actually done, and this is even more of a, um, interesting exercise behind the scenes. This is using a MySQL database. This is grabbing what are called RSS feeds, which we'll glance at in a moment. But it's also fetching, um, one time only, all of the full text of the articles, getting rid of all of the HTML from the website by just stripping it out, getting rid of all of the CSS, all of the JavaScript. And then it allows you, with MySQL, to use full text searches of all of the articles on campus. So there's actually some really juicy stuff we'll peel the layers back of over time. But what this boils down to is a lot of these websites have RSS feeds. TheCrimson.com is the undergrad's um, magazine. 
here's their web page interface, but it's kind of fun. And I'll admit to getting even more into this. A lot of browsers have little RSS icons or something in the top right corner. This means, hey, this page has an RSS feed. So what I did was went to this website. And unfortunately here, this is Firefox's built-in rendering of an RSS file. This is not RSS per se. But if I view the source, I do in fact see what has been sent to my computer, and it looks an awful lot like you can. It's just XML. So RSS, really simple syndication, though the acronym means different things to different people, is an XML feed. And it's just an increasingly popular way of syndicating information. So the spec for this happens to live um, sort of across the street at the law school. Um, but what it boils down to are some very basic elements. Um, and in fact, RSS is not the best language for semantically tagging things like articles because it really doesn't distinguish interesting tidbits very well. But a canonical RSS feed has these things, an XML declaration optionally, an RSS root element with an attribute specifying its version, we're up to 2.0, a channel which describes the Harvard Crimson, the Harvard Gazette, whatever the news source is, that itself has a title, description, link, and then zero or more items, each one of which conceptually represents an article. And each item has a GUID, as I mentioned earlier, a title, a link, description, a category, and pub date. And then there might be more and more of these things. So in fact, the way that I went about parsing all of these RSS feeds on campus is I first took the very uh, manual approach of just Googling around, trying to find these feeds on campus themselves, then jotting down the URL of these RSS feeds, and then literally using the simple XML API, just grabbing all of the RSS feeds, iterating over the channel elements, iterating all of the, the item elements, grabbing all of those, tucking them away into my MySQL database, just so I don't have to constantly reparse the same file. And then once a night, I, or once, uh, once, uh, once per article, I then use PHP to query via HTTP the entire website, the each article's link, get back all of the junk, the HTML, get rid of all of the metadata, and just boil down the article in my database to the raw text of the file. And it literally is using very basic building blocks like this stuff here, albeit with some fanciness like the full text search and some JavaScript and ultimately um, some caching tricks. But it really boils down to something as simple as this and a couple of for loops. So this hints at what you'll be able to do um, with relatively easily with project one. Now, fortunately, XML also comes with um, at least one query language. So we're going to talk later in the semester about SQL, which is a very popular language for querying traditional relational databases. XPath, or the XML path language, is a language for querying XML files that may very well be useful too for project one. And just to give you a sense of what this can do, and there'll be more on this next week and also in sections, um, XPath allows you to specify what's called a location path which looks like a file system path. C colon backslash foo slash bar slash whatever. Same idea for XPath, but you instead would say something like slash lectures slash lecture slash resources slash resource. So you take steps, not by way of arrows, but by way of slashes, but you can do filtration. Uh, by filtration, I mean you can have predicates in these things called square brackets. And you can say, in this case, start at the root, give me all children called lectures, Give me all children called lecture, but only give me back the lecture whose number is zero. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, let's try this. Let's try a little piece. And now notice I'm being particularly verbose just to be really consistent with the formalities. But child colon colon can be omitted entirely. So we can make this much shorter as I'll do in, real, in the reality here. So let me go ahead and say, you know what? I don't want to anymore iterate over uh, this whole thing. So I'm going to make lectures2.php so I don't throw away the code we wrote already. What I'm going to do is, you know what? I don't want to iterate over all of the lectures. I just want to get at one lecture. So let me go ahead and get rid of that for loop and instead do this. So I'm going to say uh, lecture gets XML XPath. And then I want slash lectures slash lecture uh, predicate at signed for attribute, uh, number equals two, close bracket, quote, semicolon. What this should do is return to me an array of all of the nodes that match that expression. All right, so what's that? Oh, thank you, thank you. Typo, xpath, not path. 
So what this will do now is return to me an array. So actually, this should be plural, just to be consistent with that. XPath returns a, an array of all of the matching nodes. Now, I know myself that there's only going to be one node that matches there. But what you'll find, and this is where it's a teaser for Project One's purposes, and again, we'll revisit next week in sections. This query language will allow you to do lookups, so to speak, in your XML file. So that presumably, when you implement Project One, to submit it to your PHP code are going to be things like unique IDs for pizza or the names of items that the user wants to order. And you on the back end are probably going to have to do a quick lookup of the price because you don't want to trust the user to send you back the price. So you don't have to, for instance, iterate over your whole file using lots of for loops. You can dive as deep as you want using predicates in this language called XPath just to pluck out that element or attribute that you want. So more on that to come. We'll see you next week.